Good morning. Welcome to Bothorpe Church. A very warm welcome to you uh, on this Sunday uh, morning. Uh, I do pray that you've had a, a good week. Um, but however your week has been, we come uh, to the Lord. We bring ourselves to him as we are. And to prepare our hearts for worship, we're going to sing the song, Hide Me Now Under Your Wings. So let's prepare our hearts as we sing this song together. Well, coming up uh, this week, uh, there's another uh, quiz night on a Wednesday evening. That's uh, uh, Wednesday at 7.30. I will send out an invitation. Um, please do come along if you like that kind of thing. Um, and uh, thank you to all those of you who came to the uh, the prayer evening uh, last Tuesday. Uh, I I hope you found that a very special time being together um, on the church grounds. Will we read these words from Isaiah fifty six? And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve Him, to love the name of the Lord, and to worship Him. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain, and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come rejoicing in your presence, for your love is stronger than death. Your mercy reaches from the heavens to the very depths, and your kindness is seen in your grace in Jesus our Lord. We praise your holy name. Amen. And we come with humble hearts before you, Lord, and can confess our sins as we say together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May God our Father forgive us our sins and bring us to the fellowship of his table with his saints forever. Amen. We sing the song now together. Here I am and I have come. I will always love your name. Let's sing this together. I hope you enjoyed that song together. And now I'm going to be uh, looking at uh, a particular book last time I did a, a book review and this week we're going to be looking at this book called I Dared to Call Him Father. It's not a new book, it came out in 1978. Uh, it's by a lady called Bilkis Sheikh who grew up um, as a Muslim in Pakistan uh, of noble birth um, but when her husband left her uh, she started searching for deeper meaning in life and for peace. And then one day she had a couple of dreams in which she met with John the Baptist and Jesus. And she didn't really know these two characters. She knew they were in the Bible. And so she started to read. And one day she was in her garden and suddenly she, she spoke about a presence being there in the garden, something that she'd never experienced before. Well, this book is her story. It's well worth reading. As I say, it's not a new book. Maybe you've read it before, but it's an inspiring book. 
about how someone can turn from an apparently great life, we, you know, wealthy, having everything that, you know, she needed in life, to realizing, in fact, she had nothing. And the one thing that she wanted above all was to know the presence of God. Well, it's an inspiring book. So if you've got it, maybe you need to reread it this summer. And if you haven't got it, maybe you want to uh, to borrow it uh, or to buy it. Um, but whatever, I hope that you do enjoy uh, reading uh, I Dare to Call Him Father. Well, now we're going to have our reading, uh, followed by today's message, which Mike Acaster is going to bring us both our reading and our message. So, Mike, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Our reading this morning is taken from John chapter 2, verses 13 and 16. And I've taken as my theme, disruption. Is it all bad? Now, the Jewish feast of Passover was near, so Jesus went up to the temple. He found in the temple courts those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers sitting at tables. So he made a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple courts with the sheep and the oxen. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold the doves, he said, take these things away from here. Do not make my father's house a marketplace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So that set me thinking. During this pandemic, we've all been facing significant disruption in our lives. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, clearly the pandemic disruption is a bad thing. But is disruption always bad? Or can it also be a good thing? I remember when I was working, we looked at ways to help organisations deal with introducing change into their business processes. Clayton Christensen, in the mid-90s, seems to have been the first to have used the term disruptive technology. It's a very popular concept with startup businesses or the techno whiz kids on the west coast of America. What do I mean by disruptive technologies? Simply a technology that changes how we do something. Take phones, for example. These replaced letters as the means of communicating with people over a distance. Only for that technology itself to be disrupted by mobile phones and now smartphones. And again, it's been hard to go shopping during the pandemic and many of us have resorted to online shopping with the likes of Amazon or eBay or just via the supermarket's own websites. Many stores have indeed accelerated the switch from the old technology of in-store shopping to online shopping. And we've moved over to this new technology very quickly, thanks to those smartphones and the apps that make it incredibly easy. Though I must admit, I do have to chuckle when the supermarket's uh, advertisements have been promoting their online home deliveries, as if it's something earth-shatteringly new. I'm not so young that I can't recall my mother dropping off her handwritten shopping list to the corner grocers. And later that same day or evening, a young lad popped around on a bike with a big wicker basket on the front, full of all the stuff from my mum's shopping list. So I'm reminded of the saying from Ecclesiastes that there's nothing new under the sun. So it strikes me that we've gone back to the same effect only it's less personal, less local, higher tech, a higher CO2 and energy footprint. So I guess there's progress for you. Perhaps after the pandemic, we might revert to our local suppliers who got us through the lockdown. You never know. 
disruption is applied to rail services, airlines, ferries, roads is never a good thing. Disruption to food supplies at the start of the lockdown was definitely not a good thing, was it? So is disruption only ever negative? Well, while the West Coast tech industries might like to think they've invented new ways of living, I rather think they haven't totally done so. And I think the idea of sweeping away the old with new ways of doing things goes back much further than 94 or 1983, when Amazon or the internet was starting out. It goes all the way back to Christ and his sacrifice for us, changing forever our relationship with God. And in our reading this morning, we see him disrupting the religious life of God's chosen people who have gathered together to celebrate the Passover. They have come together to worship God and celebrate past deliverances by his hand. Examples of his covenantal love for the chosen nation. Now, these are devout people who have come together because they remember God's claim on their lives. And in this passage, we get a picture of Christ as a man of action, behaving badly, rashly even, in disrupting the normal religious practices, which surely were handed down from God after all. So I ask again, is disruption only used in a negative sense, as an undesirable change from the old and familiar to something that is new and uncertain? This disrupted Jesus is a stark contrast to the Jesus described in Matthew chapter 5, and one many think of, a meek and mild Jesus, when he extols us to turn the other cheek and not resist an evil person. Well, here we see him going well beyond resisting and physically driving the money changers and other merchants, animals and people out of the temple courts. This is not the often cherished view of the Messiah as a soft-spoken, turn-the-other-cheek kind of guy while calmly confronting the religious authorities of the day. No, here is a man of action. He rolls up his sleeves, charges straight through the heart of the religious establishment. Now this must be a story of some importance, as all four of the Gospels record it. Some may say that Christ did not whip anyone or any animal, he merely cracked the whip. Maybe yes, maybe no, is it important? What Christ is doing has a way though of being disruptive and overturning lives, not just tables and stools. I sometimes think that we forget that Christ is more confrontational than we might like to remember. It's a characteristic, after all, of his work in this world to convict us of our sins and help us change our lives. From our reading this morning, such a disruption was clearly at an institutional level when the God-given practices used to worship God had become embroidered and distorted by man. And it's also true at an individual level too, when Christ convicts us of our sin, we accept him into our lives. I recall a minister once asking me why I was surprised at this contrast to the Jesus meek and mild image. After all, just look at what he's got to do. He has to confront us where we're at and convince us of our sin and that there is a better path to follow, that of following him. Overturning tables, disrupting life, is really the way of our loving and gracious Lord. If we look right back at the start of his ministry, didn't he also totally disrupt the lives of the fishermen, giving them a new calling to be fishers of men? They were probably quite happy running their fishing boats and selling fish, because they must have been reasonably successful. They owned the boats, they had hired men. Yet when Christ called them, they gave all that up to go and follow him. What faith they showed in this young unknown man to follow him into a work that was far more challenging than catching and selling fish. They were to persuade their fellow Jews of that new relationship and covenant with God, as you can read in Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. The old ways were to be supplanted by a new normal. And this pattern has continued to this very day and beyond. 
Our presence here this morning bears witness to Christ's disruption in our own lives. And many can look to changes in career aspirations that, like the disciples, were moulded and changed through the Holy Spirit in a meeting with Christ. I often use the example of Gavin Peacock, a reasonably successful footballer who played for Queen's Park Rangers, Chelsea and my home team, Newcastle. He was on the cusp of becoming a regular TV pundit with the BBC, but he gave it all up to train to become a minister and now leads a church in the Rockies in Canada. Myself, I made a temporary move to Norwich on a two-year contract that is now 30 years ago. And I know many here are able to point to similar circumstances in their own lives. If you look at the internet, it is full of people's testimonies of how after letting Christ into their lives, they turned away from crime, drugs, abusive relationships, you name it. You can find people whose lives were completely disrupted for the better by Christ. It is simply what he does. At the temple, Christ was disrupting a solid, well-established institution. The temple in Jerusalem was at the centre of national and religious life. The temple was where God was, where he met with people. It was also a symbol of God's relationship with his chosen people. It had been built following God's plan and served as a reminder of God's promise and claim on their lives. However, not all was right and proper. While the sacrificial practices and intent was laid out in the Old Testament, you have a look at Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers, some of these practices had moved beyond perhaps what was intended, perhaps as a matter of expediency, perhaps as a means of raising revenue even. Thus, special currency requiring money changes and the sale of sacrificial animals on temple grounds. Just think how much easier that made life. You no longer had to drive your best animals, no longer had to haul your harvest first fruits to the temple to make your sacrifice, no longer needed to plan ahead. All that could be taken care of now when you got to the temple. How good was that? How much better for the worshippers? and for the commerce of the temple. Something I'm sure both worshippers and the Sadducees were more than happy with this arrangement. So why was Jesus so angry that he wades into the temple, overturning tables and wielding a whip to drive out both animals and people? Simply put, it was because the house of God had become little more than a commercial activity, being exploited by the rich and powerful in Jewish society. It took away from the time people had of being with God. They had made it something it wasn't meant to be. And it's interesting, in the reading, generally the crowd seemed to have welcomed Christ's action, while the money changers, animal merchants and temple authorities did not. If you think about it, grace itself is disruptive in that it happens when we least expect it. It challenges our assumptions. It contradicts us and changes us. The grace of God in Jesus Christ is probably nothing like what we wanted, but it's exactly what we needed. Look at the changes it has wrought in the life of the author of the hymn Amazing Grace, John Newton, who went from slaver to minister and author of hymns. His meeting with God brought about something good from the depths of human depravity. The disruption of grace doesn't come to us because we were born into a good family or because of our race or our ethnicity. It doesn't come to us because we've worked harder than anybody else. And it certainly doesn't come to us because we desire it, although many are seeking it. It comes to us from God, by God and through God. It takes us from where we are, from somewhere bad, to a better place and a better way of being. So perhaps if you want a peaceful and disturbed life, following this Jesus Christ may not be for you. For in following him, we should expect disruption, having our assumptions challenged, our goals and aspirations changed to his will. But the good news 
is that this disruptive Lord we follow does not abandon us. When he commissions us to carry out the will of the Father, our loving Lord also sends the Holy Spirit to empower us and strengthen us for the task. He also boldly confronts all that is still inappropriate within us and among us. So may we continue to praise and worship our loving Saviour. May we thank him for the disruption he has brought into our lives. And may we share this disruption with those around us, our family and our friends. The disruption that Christ wrought in our lives is far from being negative. It is the most positive thing that can happen to us as we move from condemnation to life eternal. May we praise him for continuing to be disruptive in our lives. Disruption isn't always easy, I know, but Christ's disruption helps to make us less complacent and more nearly the person, the people, the community that God created us to be. Amen. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you for your message this morning. It's given us plenty to think about. Uh, and I'm just wondering what's challenged you or encouraged you in today's teaching from God's Word. What will you take away into this coming week? I'm sure we can all think of times when our lives have been disrupted by God in some way, shape or form. But uh, thank you, Mike, for reminding us actually that can be such a positive thing. Um, it's, it was once said that as human beings we like to be settlers, but God calls us to be pioneers. And uh, so I think we need to reflect on Mike's message today, that we are sometimes disrupted by Christ, and that's a good thing. We come now to our prayers of intercession. So let's pray. Loving God, we pray for your church at this time. We pray for wisdom and courage for our church leaders. Wisdom to know the direction you're leading us by your spirit. And the courage to follow you in that way. Forgive us for desiring the form of worship more than we desire you. And free us to worship you and focus on your ways of love and mercy. Loving God, we continue to pray for this nation during the pandemic. We pray for those who are unwell and, st and are still self-isolating. We pray that the uh, rate of infection may stay low so that people can start to see the way ahead and not live in fear. We also pray for other nations where the virus is spreading. May those in authority who are tasked with making life-changing decisions have godly wisdom and compassion. May they not be driven by self-interest or greed. Loving God, thank you that in a world in despair you are our hope. Help us to remain true to you with all our hearts. In this season, where some are reaching out for you, draw us to those people and give to each one of us the ability and desire to speak your word. In loving God, we pray for all those who've lost loved ones. We pray for Christine McGrath and her sister-in-law, Anna, following the death of her brother Tony. Be with Christine and Bob and Anna during this time. Be with the family and all who've lost loved ones at this time. Comfort them with the closeness of your presence. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we break bread together, we're gonna to sing the communion song, Here is bread, here is wine, Christ is with us. Let's sing it together. Well,
or we gather around the Lord's table, we are welcomed by the Lord himself, who is the host. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good, our duty and our joy always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, the King of glory. Born of a woman, he came to the rescue of our human race. Dying for us, he trampled death and conquered sin. By the glory of his resurrection, he opened the way to life eternal, and by his ascension gave us the sure hope that where he is, we may be also. Therefore, the universe resounds with joy, and with choirs of angels we sing forever to your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and gave it to them, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, send your spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break may be for us the body of Christ, and the cup we share may be for us the blood of Christ. May we and all who share this food offer ourselves to live for you and be welcomed at your eternal feast. Lord, where all creation worships you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, And we pray the prayer now, which Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. the body of Christ, keep you in eternal life. The blood of Christ, keep you in eternal life. So, 
So let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. We sing our closing song. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Worship his holy name. Well, let's close in prayer. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.